Welcome to Facing Future. We're here today with Stan Cox, who is a plant scientist and author of um, the book, The Green New Deal and Beyond, and also the, pa uh, the Path to a Livable Future. Raya Salter is an attorney and a professor, and she is the author of Energy Justice, uh, the US and International Perspectives. So we know that the rampant consumerism that goes on in the first world is extracting resources from poorer nations and destroying their ecosystems. We are sort of mindlessly mining the world for a, a system of life that really cannot sustain. Uh, Stan, you talk in your book about the, that racism is inherent to the climate crisis. Can you uh, enlarge on that a little bit? In the, the situation we're dealing with now, uh, both within this country and uh, around the world, we have the, the people who are responsible for producing most of the greenhouse emissions and, and also the um, uh, extraction and exploitation uh, going on in uh, ecosystems are not the ones um, suffering the consequences. The, the low emitting populations uh, of the world uh, they are the people who are already suffering the worst impacts and will, will con continue to suffer that. But the, the wealthy nations and the wealthy uh, classes within those nations are uh, refraining from doing anything uh, effective uh, about climate because uh, they say it, it's bad for business. It's going to hurt economic growth. Yeah, keeping the economy growing versus having a livable planet. <laughs> really, right. that dichotomy yeah. is, hasn't been yeah. driven home enough. Yeah. Yeah. Raya, you've worked on a lot of projects in New York uh, in terms of climate justice. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for highlighting the importance of climate justice. An example of how the communities who have done the least are experiencing harm first and worst. We can just look no further than Ravenswood Generating Station um, in Astoria, Queens here in New York City, one of mm -hmm. the largest polluters um, in New York State, literally across the street from um, the nation's largest public housing complex and in the vicinity of over 1.3 million people. Incredible, right? <laughs> so we're, we're unaware of the harm we're doing because we're not feeling it ourselves so immediately. Mm. Uh, that was true at the, the COPs 26, at all the COPs really, when, when poor nations would come up and say, you're killing us, you know, we're going underwater and you know, you're ignoring the problem. Um, we then have the, the question of how could we reduce our uh, consumption? How could we stop extracting resources? Uh, renewable energy promises to be shiny and bright. You get your brand new car and your solar panels, but gee, that's not going to do it, is it, Stan? Neither the, uh, the various Green New Deal proposals nor the, um, the climate action that is, um, or the climate legislation that is languishing in Congress right now because it, uh, it's been become impossible to pass it. Ne neither one of those um, contain provisions for the, the one thing that uh, has to be done. Um, otherwise, all the other efforts will go for naught. And that is the reduction and, um, and, and very soon the elimination of uh, fossil fuel burning. Um, they're building a whole bunch of uh, uh, hundreds of millions of electric vehicles isn't going to do anything to um, prevent society from drawing more oil, gas, and coal out of the ground. So what would be required in this country, say, a, a national cap on the quantities of oil, gas, and coal that can be extracted or imported and, and burned and have that cap decline towards zero on a crash schedule are we really able to do that though? Renewable energy is gonna take a lot of fossil fuel to create. You do mention in your book that um, renewable is probably not the best word. Uh, you know, a forest is renewable. <laughs> a solar panel really isn't renewable in the same sense. Yeah. We cannot have the same amount of energy by far. I mean, I think that's something people have to really understand 
is that we're not going to just yeah. we're, we're not now, as you point out, replacing fossil fuels with renewables. We're just adding to the energy that we now have with us, with renewable so-called renewables. If, if you bring in new sources of energy, uh, uh, growing uh, society is always happy to find ways to use more energy. And the buildup of um, uh, renewable energy has to be accompanied by the elimination of, of fossil fuels. And it also has to be limited but for um, ecological reasons, batteries being one of the, the uh, biggest uh, users, but, it, but every part of the infrastructure is going to require a lot of um, uh, metallic resources. And a lot of them, in fact, the bulk of them, in most cases, are under uh, some other country's soil. So we, uh, it, we could easily see what has been referred to as a green, green imperialism or mm -hmm. uh, creating um, green sacrifice zones around the world. Right, lithium wars instead of oil wars, have we really made an advance? <laughs> <laughs> but I think the key uh, understanding is that we really have to have less energy in the first world. We really have to reduce. We can't have all these different products um, and, and ship them all over the place. Um, we we got to put our heads down, I guess, and, and have far less. And um, you, you point out that people have accepted this in the past mm. when there was the New Deal, the original New Deal. Um, and there was, um, you know, a change of uh, people having certain rations. People understood equality was an essential uh, characteristic to a healthy society. We have lost that sense completely. We, we have such an unequal society now. Mm. You know, the billionaires have all the, all the wealth in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that's right. The, the spirit that... Um, got us through the 1940s and the, um, you know, with fair shares rationing and uh, allocation of resources toward producing uh, essential goods and services and, and the um, bans on wasteful production. I think the COVID epidemic has shown us how we've lost our um, collective ability to, um, to adapt to a dire situation and to come together and work together. Yeah, it's like we we know that we need to reduce consumption and we, we're going to need to sacrifice something to get out of this crisis, yet it's become politically so intractable. And, and you mentioned how you know the bills in Congress don't provide those mechanisms to actually ratchet down fossil fuel use. And we know even the softer incentive program that came forward was stripped out by um, Senator Manchin, who, you know, is the head of the Energy mm -hmm. Committee, and, and, you know, we're left in this difficult situation. How do you think we can get back to some type of idea of, of collective sacrifice and needing to work together on things? Yeah, that's the 50 more, <laughs> $64,000 question, isn't it? <laughs> what will motivate people to, to care about each other and to care about the planet? That's a, a tough one, because we, I mean, Throughout, there you know there are infinite number of uh, cases and, and relationships throughout this country where people do are motivated to do that, and where, where people are practicing extraordinary uh, generosity and kindness, and, um, and cooperating and you know building uh, movements. We you know we saw the the outpouring in in. Uh, 2020 with uh, after um, the murder of George Floyd, how, how people came together um, at that point. But it's not everybody and, and that uh, therein lies our, uh, our problem. The old uh, um, uh, US disease of, um, of uh, ultra individualism is um, uh, really, an, it's there. It's it's not uh, it's not a majority of people, but it, it's a enough of the country to really make things difficult. Well, you know, as you say, the, the Black Lives Matter movement was massive. I think it was the largest protest movement ever in this country. Um, and you know, the climate movement 
uh, can join, <laughs> uh, you know, because it's 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 really a, people of color are suffering a lot from our militarized insanity. Uh, you know, the the uh, prisons, as you point out, we have all these ridiculous prisons everywhere, and we're we're dragging in you know whole generations of people into those prisons so that we can have this military prison, if you like, a complex. Uh, we spend huge amounts of money militarizing and, and making new weapons when we desperately need to, you know, if you're gonna make anything, make a solar panel, not a new weapon. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Please. <laughs> um, you know, how, how do we, is there any possibility of taking the military and budget and, and redirecting it to ecological programming? Wouldn't that be? Now, as I, um said in these books, if, if this country does finally decide to uh, take effective action, that the very first thing needs to be diverting resources away from the military, which I don't, it would, the, the, our military would be, if it were a country, it would be one of the biggest um, sources of greenhouse gases um, among the, the world's uh, countries. Right, you're a lawyer. <laughs> You've dealt with laws. Um, you know, laws are, are great if they're constructed very well. And uh, <laughs> we, of course, have this terrible problem of division in our country between Republican and Democratic interests. And the incredible partisanship of our, our politics makes it almost impossible to do anything. But things have happened in, in New York, for example. There, there have been new rules about methane, which was pretty amazing that we we banned fracking. So maybe we can't do it federally. At the moment, we probably can't, but we could do it on local, in local laws and local levels. Yeah, it's what's happening on the federal level is so difficult, so disappointing. In fact, it seems like the only thing that the parties agree on is funding the military. <laughs> That's the only thing they can sort of get yeah. through together. But yeah state action still on climate still is really important. And I'd say now it's um, as important than ever. New York state has adopted very aggressive um, greenhouse gas emissions goals economy-wide and mandates that it be done in a just way. We've seen Washington state move in that direction and we need to, it's, it's challenging. It's, it can be frustrating because it can feel incremental, but it's important and we need to keep working on state action as well and getting other states to comply. Yeah, well, not to mention other countries, <laughs> uh, but but our example, you know, has always been very important for the rest of the world. Uh, you know, whether we sign a pact or whether we agree with a pact. Um, Stan, you did a lot of looking into the history of the mm. environmental movement and and the New Deal itself. So, what what would be of the future as you see it. I mean, we we talk about eliminating fossil fuel and pretty much people agree, although we don't do it. Um, but we don't talk about the fact that the future depends a lot on the ability of the land and the oceans to recover themselves. To be, it used to be called nature, now we call it carbon sinks. The good news is that everything that we need to do to actually have the, the ecosphere uh, absorbing um, uh, carbon dioxide rather than uh, being a, a net emitter on the lands that uh, humans manage. Everything we need to do to accomplish that are there are things that we needed to be we need to be doing anyway for uh, many other reasons for the, the health of the soil to restore um, soil ecosystems and then soil degradation to pr protect fresh water to uh, protect the oceans from um, the pollution that causes uh, uh, die-offs, dead zones in the ocean. And they, and they would all help with um, re reducing uh, greenhouse emissions as well. Um, and, and some of the things that we do need to do in, include um, eliminating the um, uh, feedlot uh, industry for cattle and, and confined um, uh, confinement operations for uh, uh, hogs and poultry. Uh, and then if we're, if cattle are feeding on grass as they, as they should be, uh, grass and alfalfa, et cetera, rather than, um, than corn and soybeans, we could 
um, take uh, you know, millions of acres out of uh, corn and, and soybeans, which requires pulverizing the soil, uh, requires huge amounts of um, uh, fossil fuels, um, both for track to run tractors and also to produce nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, a lot of that, all of that could go into um, perennial grasses um, and, and, and perennial uh, mixtures of different kinds of plants, which is what a prairie is, uh, all perennial. Uh, we would restore uh, healthy root systems to the, the soils throughout uh, much of the country where uh, agriculture is being practiced. All, all of that would and not only reduce emissions, but um, produce both uh, uh, healthier, um, uh, healthier, more healthful uh, food, and um, and protect uh, eco and restore ecosystems. We had a huge amount of topsoil in this country when the white man came, and what have we got left? What what is the situation with the soil right now? The, um, it depends on where you are in, in the country. The, um, in, say, in, in the southeast, um, the, the, you could say the topsoil that we um, kind of had rid the soil of topsoil um, down in the southeast um, back in the 1800s um, when uh, you know, the because of the, uh, the cotton industry and other things, and because those uh, soils are, didn't have much topsoil uh, to begin with, um, agriculture almost completely crashed until uh, the early um, 1900s when um, the uh, industrial method of uh, producing nitrogen fertilizer um, was developed using huge amounts of natural gas and, um, and, and the phosphate industry and so forth. So it's, um, as we've been uh, saying in, in many cases, we've been uh, having to replace soil with oil mm -hmm. uh, because it's only fossil fuels that made that possible. Um, here in Kansas and through the um, up, upper Midwest, it, it's a different case because of the uh, glacial uh, soils that were there that supported the, uh, the prairie ecosystems across uh, you know, hundreds of millions of acres throughout the country uh, and were there through uh, you know, many millennia, many ice ages. Um, that soil is so deep that we haven't um, gotten down, we haven't eaten up all the uh, topsoil yet, but um, because of the, the drive for ever higher yields and the uh, growing of grain for um, uh, unnecessary purposes, we have, certainly we've uh, depleted the, uh, and, and because we're tilling every year, um, it's depleted the nutrients of the soil, so they also have to be um, uh, restored with uh, petrochemicals. Where there used to be in the prairie, it, these extensive deep root systems uh, going down several yards into the soil, it's a soil, it, it was a, a living ecosystem at that time. Now it's like clear cutting uh, below ground. You know, after every season, the um, the roots of the the crops die, and um, and, and there you know, no living roots in the soil for a good part of the year, and then they have to start over. <clears throat> the South, of course, we built on slavery. <laughs> right. You know all these uh, depleting uh, crops. Uh, other, you lived in Hawaii, Raya, for quite a while, and uh, you know pineapples, uh, sugar you know, certain crops have been incredibly destructive of, of particular, you know, nations and groups of people. It, it goes back to the, the convo we were having before about what are the root causes of the climate crisis and how much, you know, colonization, racism, and extractivism really have driven this problem. And I was listening to you, Stan, and I, uh, it's incredible the 
the level of extractivism, you know, the fossil fuel economy has extended to agriculture to such a, a deep extent. I mean, it's 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 jaw dropping. Yeah, it's it's true. We we could not do our current culture without fossil fuels. Therefore, we have the question: What kind of culture do we really need to have and want to have when we don't have fossil fuels? How can what what does the future look like when we really are doing well? Let's say 100 years from now, we've sort of you know, fixed some of the problems. Uh, are people living in cities or people, you know, let's do a little envisioning. What what would the future be? I'll give a, a quick response in terms of sort of a, a hope or a optimism that we could address or that at least we can understand the, the, the prominent, the root causes and we can begin to address how can we work together, the divisions that divide us, the focus on individualism when we need to be thinking more about collectivism and healing some of these root causes. So I, I know that that's a pie in the sky, um, but as an optimist, that's, that's my initial response. Well, yeah, community is going to be something we really need in the future. We're, we're trading materialism for relationships, for, you know, for, for caring about each other, for, for, you know, a healthier, more uh, connected life, connected to the earth and connected to each other. Um, that seems to me, you know, Stan, you wrote the book on this. Raya has it. I say you wrote the book on this. Raya is holding up now. <laughs> Tell us yeah. a bit about some of these paths to a more livable future. <laughs> what I uh, did in the book was try to look to um, uh, people and, and movements and who um, have maybe or maybe setting examples for how we could operate a, a future that uh, doesn't have fossil fuels because none of what we see us around see around us right now would uh, be anything like this with, uh, without uh, fossil fuels. So it will take a completely new way of living, and, and it's going to take uh, because we we can't just sit back and trust that the government someday is going to solve the problem and the corporations will go away on their own. Um, and so I, I think some of the people we can look to um, include the, um, the environmental justice movement, which uh, since the 1970s at least, um, uh, led uh, primarily by um, uh, Black and Hispanic uh, communities and, and in indigenous uh, communities um, around the US um, has, um, been very uh, effective and, and uh, ambitious in getting uh, polluting industries, uh, you know, chemical plants, power plant, coal-fired power plants, all those um, uh, kinds of industries out of uh, their um, neighborhoods or, or their um, you know, vicinity. Um, and of course, that wasn't an accident. Those kind of facilities went in there and, and, and first place um, because the, the communities were viewed as, um, as vulnerable and, and not, uh, not able to fight back, but they, the environmental justice movement has, um, has fought back very, uh, very effectively. Um, they, another um, movement that's um, uh, been around a lot longer is um, uh, the mutual aid movement that, um, actually started in in the early days of this country in um, in the um, context of uh, slavery where the either um, enslaved or previously enslaved people came came together and um, uh, mutual aid communities um, that then um, later in the, in the 19th century there were um, uh, among uh, uh, Latino Americans, there there were similar movements that uh, that uh, came up, and and uh, these uh, evolved uh, through the 20th century. We had um, uh, the Black Panthers in in the 60s and 70s, who that were um, started out as a, a self defense um, 
uh, entity, but uh, they also make, uh, made a, a lot of, well, the most famous thing probably was their, were their school breakfast uh, programs, but they also had free, uh, established free medical clinics across the country. And they, um, that, um, uh, it was, uh, uh, Fred Hampton uh, of the Black Panthers, who, um, in describing these things, he uh, he said uh, they they called them survival programs, and he said, "Yeah, that means uh, survival pending revolution." So they weren't just um, doing do-gooder things, but they were trying to build the or, and preserve and build the foundation upon which more thoroughgoing change. Uh, could be built, and, and and you know we've seen this uh, continue um, with the uh, Occupy Wall Street morphed into uh, Occupy Sandy, um, and did a lot of great work there. But there are um, there's kind of a proliferation of new uh, mutual aid groups um, uh, uh, coming along now. I say that as an environmental justice activist. Um, an advocate, it really, it warms my heart to hear you talk about this, you know, this rich history of mutual aid and activism. I feel that yes, the young folks in particular, um, like Gen Z, they're really seizing on this mutual aid concept, which is very encouraging. And I guess I also wanna say that it's something that we don't talk about enough in the climate or environmental movement, but the real need for cross-racial organizing um, and, and sort of knitting together these dots of the root causes of climate crisis um, and knitting together the, the, you know, the different movements and people. It's something that uh, is something that I think is worthy of as, as much as it's urgent that we work on climate action um, and we need to get rid of fossil fuels and do these things urgently. If you ask me, there are a few things that um, are more important or would be more impactful than addressing the depoliticization and, and having more interconnected movement. Yeah, I guess ultimately it's our compassion will is required to awaken. You know, we need our higher nature to wake up right now and to start really acting in the world. It's it's not just a technological problem. It is a, it is definitely a social uh, problem, a, a, a problem of our society that we, we have to uh, address. We have to have a whole different society and getting there is <laughs> through this crisis quite a challenge. In fact, I would even call that a definition mm -hmm. of energy justice <laughs> is realizing that we cannot focus only on technology and only on greenhouse gas emissions reductions that will not you know, get us to the, um, the mass adoption and the just results that we seek. Well, thank you both for being part of this program today. Uh, you're both warriors in the struggle for a better world, and I really appreciate uh, your coming. Thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. And it's such a pleasure to, to meet you, Stan, and to hear more about your work.